So uh, again, the sanctions. So my trip started at 11 p.m. on Wednesday and I did not get to, to Caracas until almost, I think it was like nine o'clock Thursday. So anyway, my point is I was really tired. Um, if you are going, if you are coming from continental Africa, if you're coming from Europe and Asia, you basically launder yourself through two airports, uh, either Istanbul or Paris, even though everybody I talked to went through Istanbul. I think it's probably because it's cheaper. And then I met two um, uh, Philippine comrades who were actually stuck in Istanbul for two days. Um, so the Philippine government had basically forbade anybody from going to Venezuela. And so they were just stuck there and they just like had to sleep at the airport. And they finally, finally they got to Caracas. It was like very late Friday. And then the elections were on Sunday and they like left the day after. So it was kind of crappy for them. But anyway, again, just impact of, of sanctions. Uh, so the election. So um, there were over 300 international observers from 55 different countries. Um, and, and so it was mega elections because the folks voted for 23 governors, 335 mayors, 253 lawmakers, and 2,471 uh, 2, councillors on November 21st. And so just to give kind of a brief, a brief explanation in terms of how elections um, technically work, it's an integrated system of authorization. You need your ID card and your fingerprint. And so you register your fingerprint in a national database. <clears throat> and so what happens is the voting machine is actually activated by your thumbprint. So you turn it on with your finger and then um, the logos pop up and then you select the logo of your party and you can, you can vote for multiple parties. It just takes a little bit longer. Then the machine asks you, are you super duper sure? And you say yes, and then it prints it. And then you take your printed receipts and then you drop it into a signed box number and then you sign that ballot. So you vote on the machine and then you basically confirm that vote with your signature on paper. It's super secure. It's two levels of um, authorization. Um, and so Marvin was really good in terms of asking questions. So he asked like, when's the last day to register if you wanna vote? And it's August 26th, which seems like it's a long way away from a November 21st election. It's, it's just that um, you only vote, you're, you only register once. It's not like here with this bullshit where you have to re-register every time that you move and then you have to follow those guidelines. You do it once, they got your fingerprint and then you can vote at, at anywhere. Um, so there's that, um, just briefly voting starts. It, you vote on one day, it all happens on one day. And the, t the text, the machine texts get there at 4.30 a.m. Voting happens between 6 a.m. and 8 p uh, 7 p.m. And sometimes it gets extended. And then the, the things are randomly automated, uh, I'm sorry, audited. And so um, that's basically where it, uh, how, how they vote. And so um, if you want a more detailed explanation, Venezuela Analysis has a really good article that explains it all, it's in English. Um, and so unlike the kind of cartoon, the cartoonish US narrative about Venezuela being a, like a cruel dictatorship, voting was easy and it was fast, average of like 20 minutes. Um, and it was, it was peaceful. Um, one observation, and it's a kind of a cultural observation, is that uh, here's some photos of us acting dumb, um, that there is no mail-in voting and no absentee voting. Um, and so I attended a press conference by the CNE, which is the basically the, the National Electoral Council, and they made it very clear that, that it does not exist in Venezuela. Um, and then mailing voting really doesn't exist in Latin America, but um, you know that's arguably distinct from the way that we see voting, um, especially in Oregon and Washington, which is eliminated in-person voting. Um, so here, you know, you take your vote and you go home and you read about it and stuff like that. There, it's a community thing. It's very much like a like a, a communal process. Um, and it's something where everybody's involved. And just to give some contrast, um, you know, <clears throat> I am not the best. I mean, I only got my citizenship like two months before Trump, so I haven't been voting a whole lot. But I, 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 I bore witness to a lot of voter suppression when I was in Florida. And one of the things that they did was um, eliminate the Sunday before election day as a day to be able to vote, which was clearly aimed at Black people. Like, Black people organize souls to the polls. Again, it's a community thing. And so um, folks go to church and then church officials, which are always church ladies, they'll organize bands to take people to their precinct. And so, but that was eliminated in Florida, like I said. Uh, there, again, it's very much a communal exercise. Um, 
So here, just briefly, the photo on the right, this woman is Monica Valente. She is the Secretary Treasurer of Foro Sao Paulo. So those of you who remember who were at National Convention, we passed R14, which meant that uh, DSA was going to be, we're going to apply to be a member of Foro Sao Paulo, the Sao Paulo Forum. And so we met with her, these two guys, uh, Diego and Pedro, they're from, uh, they're from Morena, which is AMLO's party in Mexico. And so, of course, we had a meeting to have another meeting, but we're going to negotiate the terms under which um, DSA can play a role in Foro Sao Paulo because it's really only, it's it's um, really a, a forum for for parties, and we're not technically a party. Uh, so this is after the elections. This is me now. I'm on my own, um, and so I went to two places. One of them was uh, uh, Choroni, and the other one was Chihuahua, which are both like beach spots. Um, so this, I just wanted to show there's art all over Venezuela. Again, kind of just, it's just everywhere. And so some of it is commissioned by the state and uh, other parts of it are just, you know, people um, uh, painting the, the, the spaces that they live in. You'll see the eyes of Chavez everywhere. Um, and then Cuatro F is the, uh, <laughs> the site of the, his failed military coup, but it's basically what made him famous. And it's also where he's buried. Um, so this is in uh, Choroni. And so if you were to, if this photo were bigger, you were painted to the right, that's, um, uh, this is like their Fisher's collective. That's like their kind of administrative fish, um, a building for their Fisher's collective. And so another place that I went was Chihuahua, which you can only get from to from Choroni on a boat. And so the reason why this is significant, it's because uh, it's one of the places where the stupid Bay of Pigs happened. So those of you who don't know, um, a couple of years ago, there was a, 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 a ridiculously fail, like a hard fail of a coup that uh, was organized by uh, a defense contractor named uh, called Silver Corps, based out of of course, uh, South Florida, Fort Lauderdale. And so they organized like not very many, it's like 20, 30 people. They're like, oh, we're gonna lead the coup that's gonna, you know, Venezuela is yearning to be free. And, you know, once we get there, the we'll just have throngs of people supporting us. And they landed in Chihuahua and they were immediately captured. Um, and there's photos of them, like you can see they wet their pants and stuff like that. Um, but the reason why I'm bringing it up is because, you know, this is like this particular, Aquí no se habla más de Chavez is everywhere in Venezuela, and it's like we're literally one of the first things that you see when you roll up on uh, on Chihuahua. And so, like, just the arrogance that them thinking like, oh, we're going to go to this beach, and the just the people they're going to support us is just um, a testament to just how little they understand um, and how much support there is for the revolution. I mean, Chihuahua, this Empresa uh, Campesina Chihuahua is um, it's a cacao collective. So this little beach town is uh, basically economically run by this commune. It's, it's two things, it's fish and chocolate. And so um, this commune is, is run mostly by women. Um, and uh, that's uh, just the kind of front of one of their offices um, of the building that they do a lot of work in. Uh, this was Profe, uh, Profe Vincente, he's the principal of this school. And so he was nice enough. We've met him on the boat, he showed uh, me and my friends around. And so here, and again, this is just local history at this point, but Chihuahua, well, everything happens here. This is the church that founded the town because, you know, it's, it's way Spanish work. And so um, the cacao, it's all laid there and then it gets dried out in the sun, which takes like six to eight hours, something like that. And then there's the official office of the, um, eh, of the, uh, the commune. Uh, and so again, getting back to the arrogance. So this is one of the first things that you see when you get up to Chihuahua and you can't see, it says Casa de Pecao Socialista, which is House of Socialist Fish. Again, it's their, it's the workers cooperative for the fishers. And then if you actually were to go to the left here, you again, you see that sign. It's a different sign. It says Aquí no se habla de Chavez. So again, the, idea, the arrogance of, of coming to this, even this particular spot and thinking that people are gonna be against this shows how out of touch these, um, these folks are. Also, uh, I would be remiss in not thanking this chapter for uh, letting me uh, spend 500 bucks on supplies on uh, vitamins. So I was with the $500 that the steering committee donated, I filled this suitcase with vitamins, the other three, um, 
I organized to just, these are just full of other kinds of supplies. Um, and I cannot tell you enough how thankful these ladies are. So this is a commune, this went to a commune in Caracas called Altas de Lida. I don't know, I don't know what Lidia is. I don't know who it's a reference to, but anyway, it's a commune in the, um, the health clinic run by women, just like so many, um, so many of these like collectives and stuff like that in Venezuela are run by women. And so this, once you unloaded all four suitcases um, was all this stuff. And they, you can see some of the, what I bought with um, the chapter money right here. And so they were extremely grateful. And then also, um, <laughs> so this guy, Rodrigo Acuna, is an Australian, Chilean, Australian guy. He just happened to be doing a documentary. And so uh, in the documentary will be featured the supplies that our chapter helped purchase. And so we actually had to act out, like pretend act out us giving it to them, um, which was kind of funny, but anyway, um, so, so that's cool. We'll, we're gonna get featured in the documentary. Uh, this is a random photo. These are very nice Nigerians um, who came, uh, reporters who came to observe. The rest of the folks, I don't really know. Um, you can tell someone's new to Venezuela when they're wearing like a full suit. It's like a super casual, like nobody wears a full suit. <laughs> Not even Maduro wears a full suit. Um, so the geopolitical report back, let me get back to that. So, um, so just uh, broadly, um, the GPP, which is the Grand Patriotic Poll, swept the election. Um, they, uh, Basuv is part of it. Basuv is the is Chavez's party, which is part of the poll, is the biggest party underneath the poll, but it is a poll of like six, 16 or 17 different socialist organizations. Um, if uh, Care can tell me where we are with time, I appreciate it. Um, and uh, anyway, they swept, they won 19 out of 23 states. One uh, member of the opposition was disqualified um, because of criminal inquiries uh, against him, criminal and administrative uh, inquiries in, uh, against him. And so um, in terms of the significance of the whole election, um, one really important observation is that the opposition is back on the electoral route, which means that they're respecting the constitution and they're acknowledging the fact that President Maduro is, is the president. Uh, the Venezuelan government left the dialogue table that was happening in Mexico between uh, the government in power and then the opposition. And then of course the United States always being in the background. And so the reason why is because of the Alex Saab extradition. Uh, so Alex Saab, thanks Kira, uh, is a diplomat. Um, it's a long story. Basically, he was captured in Cabo Verde off the, coast of, off the coast of Africa. He was down by the United States, kind of like what happened with Evo Morales like 10 years ago. And so um, he was forced there for a year and a half. And so he was captured and then the Interpol order came. So like they didn't even have, they had no reason to hold him. And, and then now he's been extradited to the United States and he's in Miami. And so that's why they left the dialogue table. And so, um, and he was, he's just, he's a diplomat. He was uh, gonna exchange Venezuelan gold for like gasoline supplies, food medicine, that type of thing. And so the United States stopped him. Um, so there's that. And then just briefly, uh, they'll probably go back to the table next year. One of the things that's definitely gonna be a topic is whether or not the opposition is gonna run, try to run a recall campaign after, um, uh, a recall campaign on President Maduro. It's going to be their constitutional right to be able to do so. And so that's something they're going to negotiate. Uh, EU certified the elections. This is the first time in eight years they participated. So that's kind of like a knock against the United States in terms of like, it's increasingly the case that Europe is acknowledging the fact that Maduro is president, not Juan Guaido. Um, and so, uh, you know, broadly, even though the United States invited President Narnia, uh, Juan Guaido, to the uh, Summit of Democracies. Um, it's very much the case that, you know, you kind of see what might be a waning influence. So, uh, you know, um, the Lima group is in shatters. Um, OAS is considered, is, is increasingly the case that it's considered a fringe organization by Latin American governments, except for like client states like Colombia and stuff like that, obviously. But like, uh, you know, you have populist, left populist Pedro Castillo winning through. You had um, Honduras, uh, the wife of the formerly coup. Uh, really reform, like really moderate 
uh, president, um, she won. And so, uh, and she's immediately saying like, I'm gonna, in, uh, I'm gonna increase um, trade relationship with China. Um, and so, you know, it's really much, and then obviously Chileans have the right to choose what, you know, kind of a Bernie Sanders type, like not great on foreign policy, but domestically very good. Um, and then Lula might run, you know, he's been cleared to run for president. So in terms of whether or not we're gonna have a return of the pink tide is, you know, something people are, are, are talking about. So.